All right, everyone, welcome. Welcome to this special installment of Zoom with COA entitled Warning the World is Playing into Hamas's Strategy, an interview featuring West Point urban warfare expert Major John Spencer with an introduction by ZOA National President Mort Klein. The interview will be conducted by ZOA Philadelphia Executive Director Steve Feldman. I am Alan Jay, National Executive Director at ZOA. Thank you for joining us for this timely and vitally important program. We are extremely grateful to Major Spencer for joining us, especially given his demanding time schedule. Major Spencer has a hard stop at 930, so we will not have time for audience Q&A, but I'm confident we'll cover a lot of ground in the allotted time. All microphones will remain muted for the duration of the program, and I want to give a quick shout out to ZOA Communications Manager Jackie Schaefer, as always working in the background, making sure our programs run so smoothly. Recognizing time constraints, this will be an uncharacteristically brief open. ZOA's work in the media, in the halls of Congress, in the courts, on college campuses in K through 12, and in your communities continues. As we are 100% donor funded, please continue to give generously so that ZOA can be even more effective. Morton Rita Klein and ZOA National Board Chair Ruben Margulis are hosting a very important leadership mission to Israel between June 2nd and 6th. It is open to ZOA Brandeis Donor Society members and up. If you already donate at least $5,000 per year or you can donate this amount, you are eligible. Please email me directly and I'll send you details. Please also watch your emails for upcoming events. Among others, we do have two book club events coming up in May. The president of ZOA for nearly 30 years, during which time he has testified before Congress, appeared in all major media, regularly speaks with senators and representatives and other policymakers and world leaders, and has been recognized the world over as one of the most influential Zionists of our time. Here to introduce our speaker, ZOA National President Mort Klein. Well, thank you, Alan and Jackie. Welcome everyone to this really extraordinary session with one of the, really the world's leading expert on urban warfare, Major John Spencer is the chair of urban War warfare studies at the Bo Modern War Institute. <laughs> he has a very uh, important podcast from West Point. <clears throat> he spent 25 years in the armed, Sur armed forces, uh, retiring as a major. He was a company commander in two combat tours in Iraq. He's been an advisor to four-star generals, other senior leaders in the U.S. Army, doing strategic uh, research from, uh, from the Pentagon to West Point, including research on the Israel situation. Uh, he's published uh, many, he's had many publications, including a highly regarded manual for the urban defender, which has been translated into 16 languages. Uh, th this is really an extraordinary moment in Israel history, uh, where Israel has been forced to do urban warfare uh, in Gaza, to protect its citizens, to destroy the Hamas Nazi regime. And Major John Spencer is one of the people who understands this better maybe than anyone in the world. So we're honored uh, to have him today and hear uh, from him and his wisdom and uh, introducing him. Uh, that's my introducing him. My introducing Steve Feldman, uh, our distinguished executive director in the Philadelphia area, will be interviewing uh, J Major John Spencer. Steve Feldman. Thank you very much, Mort. Uh, I appreciate uh, the kind words. I want to thank my colleagues, Alan and Jackie, uh, for their work on this. And I want to welcome uh, Major John Spencer. Thank you for your service to our country uh, and for all you're doing to educate the world, really, in, in what's happening uh, in the Middle East right now. Uh, can you uh, begin by, by briefly defining what urban warfare is and how that differentiates from what we would think of as traditional warfare? Sure. Uh, urban warfare is defined by combat that happens in urban areas. And that may see, seem simple, but the definition of urban is a really complex man-made terrain, uh, population, uh, in, in varying levels of density, and the infrastructures to support them. It's the form of warfare that all militaries have avoided across the history of time from Sun Tzu till today. Uh, everybody has said avoid at all cost, and that is why it has progressively moved into urban areas, population growth, urban density, and what we're seeing here where malign actors, non-state actors, terrorists can gain an immense power because it's called the great equalizer. Because no matter your power, if I pull you into the urban area, I can remove <laughs> some advantages. 
Can you describe for our audience Hamas's strategy and what Israel's strategic responses uh, have been and how this differs from maybe any any war that uh, that anybody alive has ever uh, witnessed or, or participated in? Sure. So Hamas's strategy from October 7th was to conduct an invasion with a division level force into southern Israel, do horrific things, videotape it so the world sees it, um, re- take as many hostages as they could, retreat back into enemy territory. The strategy for the war, and there's differences in strategy, Hamas's strategy for the war was not to fight the IDF's counter response, but to have built a defensive plan, 15 years of tunnels over 400 miles, ranging from 15 feet to 300 feet underground where no military munition can reach them. They expected the counter assault. They also expected other people to join in their war from Hezbollah, Houthis to Judea and Samaria, everything. But the ultimate war strategy was to buy time for the international community, mainly the United States, to stop Israel like people have in the past when Israel is defending itself and then achieve an ultimate war stri- war victory of striking at the at Israel and by proxy the United States and surviving it becoming great champions in the world of terrorism and ultimately fulfill their grand strategy which is the destruction of Israel and the death of all Jews now Israel's strategy to that was first secure the southern border and um, kill as many of the invaders as possible And then they declared war against Hamas in Gaza in accordance with the UN Charter Article 51 self-defense with three definable objectives. Bring the hostages home immediately, destroy Hamas and its military capability, and secure the southern border. By every definition of military strategy, the IDF have done that at a historic pace and at a historic account for the protection of the enemy's population in the execution of that. They have reduced the enemy down from 24 battalions to 20. They have taken and cleared most of the enemy's terrain. They have brought half the hostages home, and they're close to achieving their victory, which is the destruction of Hamas. And if Hamas stays alive for this war in any way, even if they went into exile in some other country, they have achieved victory. Israel has lost, and Israel will be at great peril, existential threat every day going forward. It's really amazing and astounding. Uh, the way Hamas, as I understand it, as, as a layperson, has has done this with the tunnel system and embedding command control in hospitals and arsenals and schools and homes, they almost appear to be wanting to win by losing, driving up their own casualty numbers uh, of the, the people in Gaza. Uh, and, and that in, in the court of public opinion, if you will, is is the winning strategy to win by losing. Yes, hundred percent. War is always a contest of will. Hamas and its Iranian backers have studied Israel, have studied the world, have studied the United States population for years, and they built this strategy of of building the underground, which is unique in in, in all past warfare to build your underground only underneath protected populations and protected sites because they understand the laws of war, the liberal dilemma, um, the progressive agendas, that the airing of every civilian casualty, the airing of false numbers are the strategy to achieve that war goal of getting people to cause the IDF to have to stop their operation. It's the first time in the history that I've seen uh, the use of human shields, as we call it, as in putting your people or hiding behind protected sites like hospitals and mosques, That's what terrorists do. But this is the first where I've seen a human sacrifice, where the strategy of Hamas, according to them, is to get as many of their people killed as possible, to martyr them, to achieve their grand strategy to destroy Israel and to kill all Jews. I mean, it's ghastly. It's ghastly. And surely other people with with military backgrounds similar to yours understand What's going on here? They understand Hamas's strategy. They understand Israel's limitations and that Israel is acting humane. And yet they're not uh, speaking up and writing as you are. I mean, there's one or two. Uh, why, Why aren't they speaking up? Why aren't they exposing what you know and what they probably know? Why won't they come forward with what what's going on really? 
Uh, I think it's it's two things, actually, um, bias and ignorance. Um, there are a couple of people who understand war, like General Retired Petraeus, uh, General McMaster, National Security Advisor. Other than that, you have a lot of vocal voice who actually have a little bit of knowledge, but they have no clue on urban combat uh, in a war. And they so they're they're ignorant to what's actually going on in some way or they're overcome by their own biases of Israel, uh, the Jewish state or something. And they think that we're in a counterterrorism campaign, as in we the world, or that Israel is in a counterterrorism war. Yes, Hamas is a terrorist, but Hamas was had a de facto state on October 6th. It had a ceasefire. It controlled all the territory, all the government services, and it had a vast military. It's as close to state-on-state -state combat as you can get. But from day one, people like, well, I won't name names, but people have been advising to move forward with a counterterrorism strategy of such things as, you know, bin Laden raids or surgical strikes, or you're creating more terrorists, or you're not winning the hearts and mind, which have never been a calculation in war, especially in existential war. You're not trying to win the German people's hearts and minds when you're destroying the Nazi army that's trying to take over the world and create the greatest travesty in human history. Uh, same thing for the Japanese. This is war. Um, I don't know why all these people are so ignorant to what is very clear and definable and how restrained Israel has been in urban combat. Is it your opinion uh, that this strategy was cooked up by by Hamas organically, uh, maybe with some input from Iran or were there other outside uh, forces that, that helped them contrive this strategy, given its uniqueness? I think, no, I, I I don't give Hamas any credit for that. Um, they're vile human, uh, not even human. And the things I saw happen on October 7th weren't human, especially even from a soldier's perspective. And I've written about that. Now, this is Iranian's grand strategy being implemented. The use of proxies to attack the little Satan, Israel, to attack the great Satan, United States. Uh, and then this is why, again, if Hamas is able to win this in any way, it is not only a giant victory for Hamas, it is the fulfillment of Iran's strategy, and it will continue, like Hamas says, until the job is done and Israel is wiped off the face of the earth. This is 100%, in my opinion, planned, resourced, trained, directed by Iran in, 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 in over years, not just a few years. I mean, this has been a long time coming. Everything has been a test. Every operation in Gaza, every terrorist attack, um, even things going on in the Middle East uh, the, with the Houthis and everything has been a test for Iran to implement this strategy. Throughout the streets of America, college campuses, we see it in Europe. Uh, there, there are mobs of people accusing Israel of committing, quote unquote, genocide. Um, You've written extensively that the opposite is true, that Israel has conducted this war not only in, in probably the most humane way in human history, but gone to extraordinary means, including putting its own soldiers' lives in danger. 260, I think, died in battle, uh, more than 6,000 wounded in battle. Can you describe uh, the ratios of, of civilian casualties to, to terrorist casualties and and even the, the ratio of loss of Israeli troops to to the enemy. Can you can you get into that for our audience, please? I can. I'll tell you, I dislike it because of the fact it's never been done before. There's never been an urban or a war in general where anybody believes the number, especially that being provided by a terrorist organization of how many civilians are dying daily down to the single digit. It's just never happened. Um, urban battles, even recently, like the Battle of Mosul, we did not know how many civilians died until a year, if not much more, you know, much later. But for some reason, that's been the strategy using the minds of the population. Like you said, our youth around the world, especially the United States, um, adding on to what you know, the Soviet Union, Russia, everybody had talked about called active measures. But now they have a straight line into the minds of our youth um, and can convince them strongly that that number means that Israel, no matter what anybody says, like John Spencer or you know, whoever, Israel is intentionally trying to wipe, you know, kill civilians, despite the fact there's zero evidence. It's actually all the evidence is of the opposite, um, which we could get into what would happen if this would have happened to America. 
as a U.S. Sir, you know, veteran, what would happened if this had happened to the United States? It would look a lot different. I agree. And it would have ended very quickly and it would have been with overwhelming force. But yes, the IDF have moved forward, given every practice ever created to limit civilian harm in urban combat, evacuating cities among almost all its populations, telegraphing, the IDF telegraphed every bit of their activity in pursuit of preventing civilian harm. They don't take strikes if there are civilians there. They they announce with loudspeakers exactly where they're going to be. They hand out their maps to both the civilians and the enemy so that they assume immense amount of risk to move civilians out of harm's way and, and try to protect them even when they're moving to get humanitarian aid into the enemy's population. And, and you have seen a, a great loss of life in the IDF, although much less than I would have predicted in the combat in hell that is urban combat in a type of urban combat that nobody's fought um, with the depth of tunnels, the strategy of the enemy. Um, it has been amazing, not only what the IDF have been able to do, but how the truth can be turned into a lie, tapping into their biases and their ignorance on how the world works, let alone even showing what is going on right now in the rest of the world in places like Syria, Africa. Nobody cares that the fact that everything they believe is that they're, they're actually, it's the opposite and they've fallen into the Hamas trap, the Hamas strategy is exactly this. It's exactly for people to ask me that question. Well, how many civilians have died to the combatants? I'm like, well, that I can tell you, and I can tell you how it's historically low, right? So there haven't been 32,000 civilians that have died in Gaza, period. That's a fact. Um, there have been a, a great number of Hamas combatants that have been killed. And unfortunately, everyone at Travesty, there has been civilians who have been, because of Hamas, killed in as in part of the operations, which has happened in every war that's ever been fought. There is no, there is no such thing as zero civilian casualties in war, and especially urban combat, where despite what you do, even the fact that, like the IDF, took three weeks to evacuate the city and did it about 85 to 90 percent, there's always civilians who stay and put themselves in harm's way, despite everything you do to get them out of harm's way. So I could tell you the numbers and how it's nothing compared to recent history or especially any history like the Battle of Manila, the Battle of Seoul, or anyone where there's actually an enemy who says, I'm going to die in place and you got to come get me. I can't convince you, which is war, right? War is a contest of will to include on your enemy you're fighting. If you can get your enemy to surrender or just leave the place he's at, then that's a victory as well. But this enemy, of course, because it's a it's a fundamentalist, radicalized, 40,000 fighters who said, I'll die in place and I'll get as many of my civilians killed as possible. People think there's another way. And I think that's where, yes, there is another way is to end it quickly because the fact that people have fallen into the Hamas strategy has caused more suffering. And I don't think anybody talks about that. The fact that IDF Israel has, has had to listen to the United States because it does, because war is a contest of will and it needs the United States to defend Israel they have changed the way they've they've dropped the number of strikes. They've they've reduced the number of soldiers in the in the combat areas. That has prolonged the war. That has caused more suffering. And this is the great travesty: is that the, the world has fallen into disinformation, and the world is causing more harm in Gaza. What implications uh, does what you just described have for the United States and? And whatever wars we may be forced into, um, how, what are the implications? How do you extrapolate what you described—the mind, the mind control, the propaganda—on uh, on America's well-being? Immense implications. One is just the 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 world we live in now, where you have to fight a war in a fishbowl, where everybody's watching but nobody understands what they're seeing, if they can actually see into it, and they're really looking through a soda straw and making their opinions. And had there been TikTok and social media in the great wars, um, things may have been different. Uh, it, it honestly would. But now we're at a point where people believe, well, if you're a pacifist and you want no war, I understand it. That One, that's not the history of humankind. Um, and there were there's always evil that pops up. Literally the definition of evil, evil people, the Hitlers of the world, the Yayas of the world, just evil people. 
Um, and good have to defeat evil. And that's a fact that's going to continue to be a fact. But the, the, there are major repercussions if if this strategy of influencing our, our it, dangerously dumb, uh, to be honest, um, that you can fight a war with no casualties, you could do it in a different way, um, you should just let your captives stay in, in, in being raped and tortured, just wait, just take a couple of years to secure your borders. Um, it would put the United States at risk. Not only do, if this this continues and Hamas somehow is able to survive and Iran fulfills its objective, will the world be a much more violent place? But the United States will be at risk for being able to fight any war. Imagine the United States going to war, even if it's not an existential threat, which people discount in Israel's case. And we say, yeah, but how many civilians will die in this operation? Well, that's not how the law of war works. That's not how the history of war has worked. Um, you're going to minimize civilian casualties. We don't target populations anymore, like we did in World War II, where we killed, you know, 180,000 in a single night of firebombing Tokyo and 300,000 in the bombings, more than we did in dropping the two nuclear weapons. We don't do that anymore. We don't try to bomb civilian populations to convince their governments and their militaries to, to give up. Uh, we, we evolve. But we do have to fight wars. And yes, it is costly on civilian populations, but you do everything humanly possible to resist it. But if we enter a world where the world thinks, yeah, we you should respond to that evil, but do it with no with no civilian casualties dying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's impossible, it's, right? It's, it's possible. I'm in a world where I've spoken to the United Nations about their interest to cause militaries not to have um, be able to use bombs, missiles, artillery, or mortars in urban combat, which actually was an interest even in World War II. MacArthur took away air power and artillery from the forces attacking Manila, and there were still 100,000 civilians killed to get our POWs and civilians home and to take the city. Same thing in the Battle of Seoul. No air power, no artillery. But there is an actually large initiative. And if you did that, you're going to cause much more violence in the world because every terrorist like, oh, I just, I just do what the Hamas did. I just build myself under my population so that I can hit you and you can't do anything about it because the world will say, eh, it would cost too much. Uh, Two-part question. Uh, can Israel win the military war? And B, how does it win or can it win the public opinion war? So the first one's a lot easier. Absolutely, Israel can win. Israel is close to winning. It just has to finish the remaining Hamas elements that are, that are shielding themselves with their civilians in southern Gaza. Um, and the IDF have shown how to take that strategy away from Hamas in places like Khan Yunus, where I was a month ago. Remove this, move the civilian population out of the way, prevent Hamas from blending in with the civilian population, and continue the operation. They're very close to winning the war. Uh, the public, the court of public opinion, I don't know how to win that because there is a problem with our populations and their ability to critically think where they get their information, what authority they trust, which has been a long strategy of Russia and other malign actors to do this, to, to make it so you can't critically think and you believe some idiot on you know, TikTok or X who has no knowledge of what's going on, such as a statement of, look how much damage has happened. This clearly means it's all intentional. It's all part of a master plan to destroy so-and-so or... or which is actually the is opposite, and, and, and that clearly shows me their ignorance to any war that's ever happened. And what can those of us do who are watching this and listening to you now contribute to, to help win the war of public opinion, which is an important war? I mean, I think it, it, you like we have talked to, go through the alternatives. Uh, the alternative to not fighting this war was to leave Israel in a state of an existential threat forever um, and to not bring the hostages home. And for that, that practice of October 7th attacks and taking hostages and going back into your an enemy territory will happen over and over again across the world. It'll be a proven strategy as much as hijacking airplanes was a proven strategy for terrorists in the 70s. It, it means a much more violent world and walking people through that strategy um, and trying to inform them on where to get information rather than wherever they're getting it and forming their opinion. It's literally a, a crisis in our populations and critically think in the now <laughs> is is we have to allow Israel to finish the job 
And I think they're going to. And at times, Israel's had to stand alone. And in, in, in doing this, they will if they have to. Um, and I strongly believe that this leads to a better good. So the, the whole narrative has to be changed and taken back. I mean, this is absolutely um, to help the Palestinian people of Gaza is to destroy Hamas. So the billions of dollars that, that we, the United States and others were sending will actually go to the people and make it a better life for them. Uh, we have to change the narrative. Thank you, Major. I think Mort has a, a question before we close. Mort? First of all, Major Spencer, you have been extraordinary. I, I who think about this all day long, have learned so much uh, from your wisdom. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you keep on speaking out all over the world on these issues. My question is, why, do, why is it that people who understand almost as much as you, like General uh, McMaster and General Petraeus and General McChrystal, <laughs> they understand there's no genocide. They understand there's no starvation. And whatever starvation there is, is because Hamas steals the food. Uh, they understand this, uh, civilian deaths have been minimized dramatically, uh, less than in any warfare situation in history. Why are other people, not like McMaster, Petraeus, McChrystals, and others, speaking out when they understand the truth, to let the world know that these lies must stop about genocide and starvation. You you and General Kemp are one, two of the few that are speaking out about it. Why are the others so deafeningly silent? I, I don't know. I, I can't speak for them. I, when they have spoken, it's been very clear, very clear on, on the words. Um, there's, I mean, there is the bias, Mort. I used to do 15 to 20 mainstream media interviews a day about what's going on in Ukraine, which is all awful. Um, I had, since the war came on and, and I first started explaining the truth, I, I do zero mass stream medias or one every here and there. Um, some of it's that, that their voices are, they are saying things is being drowned out. Um, I can't speak to them on, you know, why not be more vocal or everything, but it's when they do speak, it's very clear on, Absolutely, you have to figure out a day after in Gaza. You have to do these things, but you have to first destroy Hamas immediately. And the quicker you do it, the better. Major, thank you so much uh, for your wisdom, for sharing your wisdom uh, with us. Uh, I wish you Godspeed uh, in your work. Uh, and I thank you. And before we close, I want to encourage everybody to read uh, Major Spencer's writings. You can search it on your favorite search engine. Uh, there's a piece in the Wall Street Journal today uh, worth reading New York Post recently. I want to encourage uh, our audience to please donate to ZOA to support us both locally in the greater Philadelphia area and nationally. Locally, you can get in touch with us at <laughs> office at zoaphilly.org. That's office at zoaphilly.org. Nationally at info at zoa.org. The national website where you can donate directly is www.zoa.org, and we are uh, philly.zoa.org. Uh, I thank you very much, everybody, for listening. There'll be a recording of this available. Please uh, let people know. We'll uh, we'll send an email out when it's ready. I thank you all for being with us this morning. I thank my colleagues, Mort Allen and Jackie, and of course, again, Major Spencer. Uh, God bless you, sir, and thank you very much. Uh, good day, everybody. Major Spencer, you are a hero. God bless you for your work. Thank you so much. I wish I could do more.